Hey, howdy. Hey, my Bruin brothers and sisters. Sup, yo. <laughs> greens, greens. Sup, y'all is pretty not, good. Not job, but try. Well, you're going to you're gonna have to work. Uh, coming up with a good one. Um, it's And it's much harder than you think. That's why I'm stuck with the uh, hey, howdy, hey, which people wonder about that, I think. But um, there's like a Disney song. I explained this a long time ago. My younger daughter, she loved the Disney music from the park and all that stuff. And there was like a song. You know, it was, and it, it has hey, howdy, hey in it. And we were driving back from a road trip out. I don't know where we were going, but we were listening to that i'm like and and i told her i would use it on the show and she was so excited that i've used it ever since because i love my daughters so much uh so it was kind of cool to uh be able to do that for her and, uh, tell her that. considering how long ago that had to be for either one of your daughters to get excited over that that's, that's impressive <laughs> yeah we've been doing the show a long time i don't know i don't know uh there's, it's got to be like a thousand hours or something by now. Somebody, somebody go and calculate how many hours we've been <laughs> on the show. Next homework okay. assignment, 100 points. I was going to say, Dad, John took forever to settle on greetings, greetings. It was, right. hello, everybody. <laughs> right. I'm just like, yeah, John, you can't do hello, everybody. Wait, wait. Yeah. Well, Michael did it so perfect. He should do that because it sounded like like oh, right. right. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello, everybody. And there you go. That's not a bad idea. How's everybody doing today? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm always thinking about uh, how my my good friend John Blickman's doing He's out there in the in the wilds of the Indiana, uh, and uh, working on the next great thing. One of the great things that they've been working on is doing uh, commercial scale equipment. And they've been doing it for, for quite a while now, a number of years. And uh, one of the cool things he's done is when you're doing, uh, you know, a, a nanobrewery or, a, you know, microbrewery, you, you need to conserve space. You, you don't want to pay for some huge building where you, uh, uh, you know, have to uh you know sell a, a ton of beer to just stay open uh that happens all the time you know you want to be conservative on space and one of the things that is actually a, a really good idea is a tall skinny three and a half barrel fermenter so if you're doing three barrel batches you know the taller and skinnier it is the more you can jam into a given footprint because you're paying by the, the the square inch on the floor not the cubic inch when you when you sign a lease right so uh, they have a three and a half uh, barrel, which they call the tall boy. Uh, it easily will fit through a 36 inch door. All the ports, fittings, everything is on the, the, the front of the tank. So you can tuck that into a corner or tie it up against the wall. It was just helping somebody set a, a 30 barrel fermenter. They're trying to get four in this one area and it's really tight. <laughs> and there's walls all around that can't be moved. Uh, and so we're just, you know, jockeying that for about an hour to get, you know, every last inch that we could, you know, but a fermenter like this, uh, nice, uh, you know, that it's, it's tall, skinny, uh, you'll, you'll do really well with something like that. And I'm sure everything else about this, I haven't personally used it, but knowing Blickman, it's going to be, it's going to be a great piece of kit. So uh, check it out. You can find it at uh, Blickman uh, uh, Engineering. Uh, in the pro brewing section uh, at uh, BlickmanEngineering.com. And if you appreciate that John Blickman for the last 15, 16 years has been paying for this show, so you don't have to, please send him a email, feedback at BlickmanEngineering.com. Tell him, thank you, John, for, for uh, sponsoring the show. And uh, there you go. Check him out. Uh, and if you're at the, uh, the Homebrew Conference this year, San Diego, uh, I bet you Blickman Engineering will be there and you can say hi to John Blickman yourself. Very, very smart guy, but very funny guy. Very humorous. Great sense of humor. Um, very professional, but, you know, once you get to know him, he is one funny dude. 
All right. Then you wouldn't be upset if somebody were to buy, say, 10 3.5s instead of that 30 barrel, just to help them save space on their rent. You know, because you know, you might pay today, but you're saving money in the long term. Well, I'm guessing that 10 3.5s is uh, takes up more room than 130. Just you know, nature nature of uh, volumes and stuff. Stackable, <laughs> but stackable. Let's contact John. Tell him. Stackable. <laughs> if you're if you're starting your urban brewery where price apartments or uh, space is at a premium and yes. you don't want to buy a, a large space but you need to be able to brew some big batches there you go there you go i'm i'm with you uh so we to answer your questions these questions come in from either you uh you know uh posting your questions live in the chat or sending your questions in via email to brewstrong at the brewing network.com. You send them in, we'll get to them, uh, you know, pretty much by the next show. Uh, not a problem. Uh, we've got some backlog that I'm, I'm working through those too, but uh, we will get to them pretty quick for you. And we do appreciate your questions. So send them in. Uh, we do really appreciate it. Um, Here's a quick one. Question regarding brewing with style. Hey, Jamel and John, I am a relatively new brewer and have a simple question regarding the recipes in brewing classic styles. If a recipe, for example, Munich Helles on page 52 has steeping grains in the extract recipe, do you still include those in the all grain version? For example, the all grain version of the Munich Helles is, has the following. Or should the melanoid malt be left out? It'd be the continental Pilsner, Munich malt, and the melanoid malt. Love the shows, both your books. You've taught me so much. Kind regards, Chris. Uh, he is at uh, Australia. Um, you guys know the answer to this, right? Yes. First off, good eye, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I didn't butcher that too much. <laughs> yeah it's everything plus the the pull out the dme lme add your base grain yeah the the base grain just swaps out for the dme lme uh and everything else remains the same hops okay. you know specialty grains all that stuff your little paragraph at the end tells you exactly what to do and nothing more nothing less if you're brewing That's all grain swap the this for the that don't change the anything else. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. If it was changed to anything else, it would be in that paragraph. But there you go. Otherwise, you would have forgotten to do that about 180 times. Yes. Yes. And I could just throw in, use the recipe the way it's written because they're all winners. And I've actually won with a couple of them. <laughs> there you go. Yes, yeah, same. There you go. All right uh let's do this we'll take a short break and we'll come back we'll have some of your questions live from the chat uh when we come back right after this all right we're back thanks all for tuning in uh, especially you guys who are tuning in live and I, it looks like uh what do you have a question for him from uh travis uh we have a question from Richard George, Var George Vargas. I, I'm assuming he goes by all three. Uh, you mean RGV? Yeah, you get RGV. Linda sure, sure. Torres, um, RGV. So as I look at the, que at, at the question and I see the video on Facebook and it's 30 seconds behind and I look over and your lips aren't moving, it kind of freaks me out. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, I have to mask that off because sometimes when I like get distracted, I'm like, ah, uh -huh. ah. It's because I see things moving. Right. I keep and, mine the same way. I've kind of shrunk the Zoom screen to see us and the questions on the side. But I switched back is, uh, because then Edward threw something in on, on, on top of it that I, I had to scroll back up. Richard's. So Richard says, the general consensus is leave, leave hops in dry hop too long leads to hop burn slash grassy flavor. I'm going to pause right there. And I'm, I'll just say there is a difference as you leave your hops in for X amount of time. So let's move on to uh, what uh, RGV says. His experience has been in an effort to avoid oxygen. He, uh, he likes to dry hop all his beers at high horizon. 
and he's had little to no hop burn or grassy flavors. Thoughts? Well, I would say that if you're, the results you're getting are what you want, then absolutely just keep, keep doing it. I, um, I don't like adding hops to uh, fermentation because they stay in the, the, in the beer too long and they become kind of harsh. And uh, I've experienced a very harsh uh, harshness with that. We, we actually did tests at Heretic for fermentation dry hopping and post-fermentation dry hopping. And in blind tasting panels, every last person 100% picked the one that was dry hopped post-fermentation. You just so, broke every philosophy ever. They've never had that occurrence. Sorry, right. anyway. Right, they always have. But it depends yeah. on the people you're, you're, you know, if you just pick random people that, you know, it's, it tastes like beer. Yeah. It's like, yeah. All right. You may get random results. Uh, but th there's, there's a value to that too. I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing uh, brewlosophy because all right. ideally, I'm sorry. ideally everybody, everybody should be able to, you know, you should get a statistically significant result from just any person, uh, beer drinker or not uh, detecting one thing or another. Right. So, uh, but it was always, the preference was for post-fermentation. Post and it's, again, a matter of time. You were, you were saying, Travis, the, there is a difference between how long you leave it in or not. But, but Michael, I, will let, I, have, I have a bit of a cleanup if Michael doesn't cover it. Or Michael's a... Well, it, well so for me, as a, as a hop guy in terms of dry hopping, and, and I actually asked you that same question at the Brew Strong Live at Brew Chatter. And, uh, but for me, I always do the after fermentation. And um, I just think when you do it at high Croyston, you get a lot of CO2 scrubbing. And, you know, if, if, if there's mm -hmm. certain flavors in there that are um, yeah. not so water soluble, they're going to get pulled Blown. out by blown off. And so, <clears throat> I always try to do for the, those kind of compounds I'm trying to get in the beer, I shoot for the whirlpool. So that way, actually, I'll leave the vegetable matter in the kettle, mm -hmm. vegetal matter. Yep. <laughs> Changes your mind. But, uh, and then that way, I'm basically, you know, putting these, these materials in, in for the whole time. And then when I dry hop on the homebrew level, um, I always think as long as you're quick and I got a buddy of brews and buckets and he he's made gold metal hazies where he opens yeah. the lid, wow. throws in his, his, his thing and closes it quick. And as long as you're quick, that's the, I mean, CO2 is heavy and, and that that's the theory is that, or not the theory, but the, the, it works out that there's a blanket that. Well, that's, that's, it. that's an, another excellent point because you don't have to worry really about oxygen during fermentation. Um, Everybody, you know, the 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 old traditional homebrew folks are like, no, no oxygen once it starts to ferment. BS. You can you, you throw it in, it's fine. It, it there's there's enough yeast in there, even at the end of fermentation. There's still so much yeast in suspension that um, it'll suck up any oxygen that you you've added. You know, the minor amount of oxygen you add, you know, thrown in the the dry hop. So yeah couple of good points yep. would you have travis uh yeah the cleanup is the time your hops spend in your beer affects the flavor you get from those hops um as as, as mike and, and jamil both pointed out you don't need to put it in on day two you still have active, active fermentation on day three day four that's fine and towards the end i i do my dry hop one day before i think my beer is quote unquote done and then two days later as it's cleaning up and I also have metal winning hazies, uh, lots of metal winning diapers and stuff. People like my beer for the most part. Maybe they say they like it just while I go away, doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> I don't think you need to hop it that early, but if you like the beer, that's, that's number one. You know, that is, if you like the beer, that's number one. But if you if, like- No reason to change like, oh, it if you love it. Right, if, if my Eldorado doesn't taste like Eldorado is supposed to taste and someone else is doing something different with their Eldorado, um, yeah lots of levers you can write. 
well, and it's good to try other things and, you know, to taste them and it, it could be better, you know, to do it a different way. And then if it is absolutely, you know, uh, make the change. If not, then, then don't. Um, all right. And then you've got another one in the, in the chat. What did you say? Yes. Edward Kent has asked, what is the best way to purge kegs of O2? We charge with CO2 to 15 PSI three times and blow off. Would it be better to fill the keg with sanitizer and blow it out with CO2? Thanks for all the great content through the years. Um, Mike, you covered this on the, the first, uh, I'll assume Edward's been tardy and has uh, missed and, and rather than ask him rewind. Edward, uh, why weren't you there for the very first uh, moment we started? <laughs> yes, you've, you've heard our feelings, Edward. Uh, Michael, you want you want to repeat what you said? I mean, it's excellent. Advice. Yeah. So, I mean, the way I think about it is, if you're you're filling with CO two and then venting, I mean, essentially you're just cutting that oxygen concentration half over and over again. Yep. And if you're doing that with five gallons, there's still probably going to be, I mean, I could do the calculations, but there's going to be more oxygen in that than whereas I feel like filling with sanitizer actually does three things you're you're sanitizing you're purging and then once you've purged i pressurize and then i have basically a leak down test so i'm doing three tests that, i'm doing three tasks in the same movement and so and then what i do too is as i'm pushing out if the keg is overflowing as soon as i start to bring it down like this tiny little volume that then i start purging with the blow off valve is you're, you're you're minimizing your oxygen as best you can. So, in my humble opinion, <laughs> that's what I do, and that's what I would recommend. Right. So, uh, at Airtech, I did calculate uh, because uh, the the keg washer that we had, well, that a lot of breweries use, it had the ability to do I think up to three purge cycles with CO two. So to pressurize it to 60 psi, then we it relieves the pressure. Then it pressurizes 60 psi, relieves the pressure. Pressurizes 60 psi, relieves pressure. Uses a ton of CO2, and does not get the the DO out uh, the oxygen out of the keg at all. My I think my calculation for something like 3,000 parts per billion. Uh, once the keg was purged three times to 60 psi so it doesn't work i mean the the better way to purge a keg is something like steam where it you know doesn't have so much oxygen in it but uh like michael's saying yeah you know fill it up with sanitizer purge it if you're going to not do michael's method uh what i would do is just hook up the co2 to the uh the uh the beer out arm uh so the to the dip tube at the bottom do low low psi low flow um you can if you have like a, a regulator that one so the other thing we had to do at heretic was purge tanks after they were cleaned uh, and open to the atmosphere, we would purge them with uh, CO2. And the the slower you go, I mean, I'm sure there's a, a bottom limit to it, but generally you go to, you know, in a keg, I would go to like maybe a quarter liter a minute or, you know, half liter a minute, something like that. You don't want to go so slow that it just mixes with everything. You don't want to go so fast that you're turbulent at the bottom. But you can fill the, the keg very slowly from the bottom, and then you could calculate how much, how many minutes it would take at a half a liter a minute. Let's say it's let's use twenty liters for the size of a corny keg. So at a half a liter a minute, it's going to take forty minutes to slowly fill that thing up and purge out. You leave the 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 blow off the uh, the pressure relief valve open and let it slowly purge that thing out. But it's not going to be perfect. So you're going to have some mix. So maybe you let it go for 120 minutes. So it's three times purged, which is what we did on the fermenters there. 
and that will get you to a pretty low DO. Um, so that'll work uh, if you're really concerned about it. Can when I, I do this as a home brewer? I yeah. I would just I I always pressurize my uh, purge and pressurize my kegs before when after I sanitize them. So I knew they were they're tight, and then I would actually open the lid. I put a little more CO2 in the bottom and then I put the beer in. And like I said, there's still yeast in the beer, unless you're, you're letting it sit for a long time. There's yeast in the beer, you put it in, it, the, the beer going the bottom is giving off CO2 because there's CO2 saturated, it's saturated. A lot will come out as you're filling it up. So you fill it up, uh, it's chasing away the oxygen and, um, once I sealed it up, I would purge the, the head space uh, a few times, and I never had any problem with, with uh, oxygen uh, caused staling. So there you go. I'm sorry, what were you going to say? Oh, no, I, I was just saying, if because you were throwing around flow rates, for mm -hmm. me, I don't have a flow meter on my regulator at home. So what I did is I took a, a trash bag with a known volume <laughs> and taped it, and actually I hooked it up to the dip tube like you're saying, there and I start the clock and then how long does it take to fill the bag at, you know, so it doesn't pressurize, but fills it. And so that would be right. standard temperature pressure or at least pressure equalized. And uh, there's, then there's, I could get a, a general flow rate. If you're looking for a little hack without buying a, or having a, a special flow meter. We call it meter. There are more ways, more than one way to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. And Michael, for that, for that, that suggestion there. You, you had 10 points. Well, I, I thought more than that, but I, I, I can offer to you, Jamil, an opportunity for Michael to give you more points. Michael said before, you know, hit pressure is up and, and pop it, pressure it and pop it, and each time you're cutting it in half. So oh. Michael was doing about 15 PSI. Right. Or, or Jamil's well. doing 60 PSI, so he's cutting it to 25% each time. Right, Mike? Mm -hmm. But well, most I, of us as homebrewers can't do 60 PSI. Right, right. Right. You're, you're literally think, diluting the, the air in there every time you 60, do it. You can do 60 in a corny keg. They're, they're good. Well, no, I don't have, my regulator can't do it. Oh, well, you can buy it. Yeah, I would hope in this, just this conversation, like, you know, the, the concentration doesn't work out to effectively do that by just pressurizing, venting, pressurizing, venting. Exactly. That's on a full that's, vessel, on a full that's vessel. The point. I'm, I'm giving you a, I'm giving you a bonus bonus five points for bringing that up. Thanks. Good yeah. job. All right. Let's see here. I'm gonna suck for the rest of the questions just so Michael wins this time. Yay! <laughs> Charity win. Did we? Did we do a break? No, because you do it so good. Um, we did one. We did a break. Good. Somebody's yep. keeping track. I keep forgetting to uh, to mark them down. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, William, he writes, uh, hi, guys. I am plowing through all your episodes, cycling to and from work. Thanks for a great show. Just listened to the episode on mouthfeel, and I was intrigued when Jamel claims that when claim, I didn't claim, I stated, uh, that when, when brewing with lower efficiency, you should adjust only your base malt to get back to the right OG. Why is this? Example, bitter with pale ale and crystal at 70% efficiency using 8.5% crystal. Adjusting that down to 50% and only adjusting the pale ale means that the crystal goes down to 6.2. Will this not alter the sugar profile of the beer as well as the taste mouthfeel? I found that adjusting a couple of percent can make a notice, noticeable difference for a beer like the one above. My efficiency varies a lot depending on the type of beer I'm brewing, between 50 and 75%. Okay, there's a lot to there's a lot to unpack here. Um so yeah, the the reason why you adjust the base malt for efficiency differences is because the efficiency of just rinsing the uh, the sugars or the or the flavor out of specialty malts that aren't getting uh, converted, generally, it's it's pretty much standard. The 
the times I've seen uh, conversions to you know commercial and homebrew fail is when in you know adjusting for efficiency they adjust everything and so all of a sudden you have way too much roasted malt way too much crystal malt you know to 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 do a um, a homebrew version of a commercial beer it's way over the top or vice versa you'll do it and the the commercial brewery they will ratchet everything down because they're getting a much higher efficiency than the home brewer does you know they're in the 85 90s homebrew recipe maybe in 70 and they end up it tastes nothing like the beer because all the specialty malts were not present so yeah it's a little counterintuitive but that's that's the crux of it um but he's also saying his efficiency is varying between 50 and 75 percent i mean what the heck is that how's he sparging yeah i don't i don't i don't know why i, I imagine if you were like okay i'm gonna do 10 I, i've got you know i'm gonna do 10 gallons of barley wine you know, or you know belgian quad or something really you know high gravity and then I'm trying to do on the next batch, I'm trying to do five gallons of, you know, uh, ordinary bitter all in the same system. Yeah, I could see having some difficulties with efficiency there. You're going to get some some efficiency difficulties. But if you're always doing, you know, the same volume of batch, you should get pretty close to the same thing. Um, you shouldn't see 50 to 75 you know a few points of difference maybe i can't tell if will is is asking something theoretical or something he's witnessed because if his beer efficiency brew house efficiency is varying that much let's focus on that before we focus on the recipes uh -huh. agree if you, you know, don't if will, have, uh what is in um uh, at davis at uc davis charlie banforth talks about repeatability and re reproducibility yeah, and you gotta nail those down, right? And you gotta be able to, to to make the same beer twice, or at least your process produces the same kind of similar. Like you're saying, there's gonna be some variance based on style and and gravity, mm -hmm. but it shouldn't be varying. I mean, that's that from much. fifty to seventy five. That's a fifty percent change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's that's and, maybe and, he's he's kind of exaggerating a little bit, possibly. Um, I would wonder if he's, because a lot of times people do not um, get the efficiency thing correct. They, you know, if it's more humid out or warmer or colder or drier, you tend to evaporate more uh, or less based on weather conditions. And that may be part of it. You know, um, he's, in, he's in the UK um you know uk in the summer versus uk in the winter um could could have enough enough difference and and so you're you're seeing more evaporation or not and and one of the things everybody should be doing is you should have a precise way of measuring your kettle volume you should and it could be as simple as a yardstick or you know some stick that you've got measures on and one of the things to remember when you're checking your volumes on this when it's hot when it's boiling it's four percent larger than the when it's cold or when it's you know fermentation temperature so you have to kind of uh take that to, into account um, it sounds like nothing but that four percent makes a big difference right especially you know if you're trying to you know but you should you should be ending at the same volume every time every time you brew you should collect the same volume, you should finish at the same volume after boil. Yep. And once you've done that, then you can start looking at efficiency. Uh, if not, you can calculate you know, what your efficiency was, even if your volumes are different, but having, having your, your volumes consistent really helps uh, with what you're doing. So, and, and that sounds, sorry, Mike. No, I, I have a, a a brew chair live question if you have time for it but oh let me uh yeah so, so that sounds hypercritical but it's not i mean don't take that as a reflection on your brewing just keep working on your process until you can nail those 
Uh, we're all uh, here I, to make better beer. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Mike. So this is actually a problem I've been having is I've been calculating my efficiencies after the louder. So like pre-boil kettle, I'll take a gravity, use that against FTGB to get an efficiency. But then yeah. I boil. Right. And then I take another gravity. And, you know, based on the volume change, I'm trying to keep them, you know, I guess I'm not truly factoring for temperature. So there's probably some wiggle in there. But I mean, actually, I am because I was actually thinking about it because I take the sample, and then I cool it down so I can get a gravity. So they're all are you insane. measuring bricks or gravity? I use SG. Usually. Okay, so S SG is really close to linear. Bricks is not linear. So yeah. I mean, if, if, if your temperature correcting, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, because I, I, I've been tweaking my spreadsheet for 10 years now. Um, I used to do it on bricks. Bricks is just not linear. Five gallons at 10 bricks down to 2.5 gallons is not equal to 20 bricks. But five gallons at, in a stupid numbers, five gallons at 1040, boiled down to 2.5 gallons, should be really close to 1080. So you're saying um, stay in, do you go to points then to do the, because I'm was i just yes, trying to like, yes, the, the, the ratio 10. of the beginning you get, you get to, to 10. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. is the five times 40 equals the 2.5 right. times 80. And on my anvil for over a year straight, I am exactly two points difference pre versus post in that multiplication. So I, if, if I'm dead on OG, I know I'm going to be two points low FG. Now that's that's not as linear as 10 and five or five and 2.5. It's 7.13 down to 6.5. And it's it's probably a measurement error that I'm doing. But points, get rid of that one times it by a thousand points are so mm -hmm. damn linear. Where bricks aren't, but All the right. breweries love bricks. Jamil, you love bricks. Uh, Plato, but yeah, you know, specific yeah. gravity is fine too. Um, yeah. it's just uh, at least in the U.S., it's more common to use Plato. Uh, I think in the U.K. they they use specific gravity all the time. Uh, yeah. well, and Michael, I think you got a great point about um, you know, you can check your efficiency um like after mash the mash, right before the boil, um. It gets a little thrown off if if you're one of those people that hits your burner the 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 moment you get like a half inch in your kettle, and you start you know you're you're, you're boiling and and you're heating as you as you fill. If you if you don't heat it up, then you could get. I mean, you could do a correction, I guess, on it um, for temperature. But uh, I guess, yeah, that that's been my biggest bugaboo in the last probably five or six brews I've, I've started to notice that my my mash efficiencies are are bang bang i can hit that number i mean i can predict it almost down to the percent but then mm -hmm. from bolt from from kettle full to 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 flame out and then actually even when i go to pitch i'm i'm kind of missing there and there's there's some fluff in there i'm working out versus i mean i, I i'm even thinking because i make starters and I haven't really done the the uh, calculations to account for an extra liter and a half of whatever the OG. I don't even take gravity readings of my starters. So there's a little unknowns there too. Mm -hmm. So that was my Bruce Strong life question. <laughs> so, so ladies and gentlemen, well, if you email a, it to uh, yeah, Bruce Strong, I will. Yeah, yeah. We'll get, get it to on that. the Facebook. And within five years, we'll get to it. It's not, not a problem. Uh, all right, uh, let's do another quick break. And when we come back, more of your questions right after this. All right, we're back. We're uh, answering your questions live. Uh, if you're if you're listening live in the in the chat room, uh, go in there and uh, hammer out a question. We'd be happy to, uh, to cover it for you. If not, you can also email them to uh, Bruce Strong at the Brewing Network.com. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we will get to them uh, quite quickly now because we're 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 prioritizing the the ones that just come in, so don't worry. Uh, but we will get to all the ones that have been sent in. Uh, Nathaniel, uh, he says, uh, "Greetings, ye stewards of stalwart suds." A couple of questions for you: What might what effect might CO two have on flavor extraction when dry hopping? I have a beer already kegged and carbonated that now seems to me like it would taste even better 
with a healthy dose of nugget hops. If I were to degas the keg, open it up, and toss a handful of hops in there now, would the CO2 that's in solution pose any problems uh, to extracting the flavor from these hops? Also, I tend to make, oh, let's see. Uh, all right, he's got two questions here. All right, let's deal with the uh, CO2 in solution pose any problems to extracting the flavor from these hops. Yeah, I was distracted there. and I missed the question, so I'll catch you up while, while Michael goes to <laughs> Go ahead, questions. Michael. So the real thing it comes down to is bubble size. And CO2 will extract at a higher efficiency of inorganic or of organic compounds that are nonpolar at a a smaller bubble size, way more. So like when I dry hop, I'll hook up the bottom drain and I just there's no stone or anything, so it's just giant bubbles. I am not worried about extraction at all because these bubbles are huge. Their surface area to volume ratios are few are 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 not conducive to mass transfer. And then um, what I would say is, as long as you don't flash your beer, like as in open that lid and let the pressure change, you're not going to get a huge amount of foam or, or CO2 emission you would be able to add that. And then CO2 in solution doesn't extract anything because it's not leaving. So you'd be fine. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the issues could be, you know, you, you, you I think he's talking about relieving the pressure on the top of the keg mm -hmm. opening the lid and throwing his hops in. You can do that, get your keg as cold as possible before you do it, and then get the lid back on as quickly as possible because Yep. You can cause the, 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 the hops are going to act like nucleation sites and the CO2 is coming out very yeah. quickly. So I, one thing very common in a lot of breweries is they'll go to dry hop a keg that's, you know, got a fair amount of carbonation in it just from fermentation. They'll throw the hops in and then beer will come shooting out the dry hop poured out the top. And we'll, it's like you speak we'll, from experience. We'll coat, coat the the coat the uh, coat the ceiling, and and you have to throw away insulation. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the, the Mentos in a Coke. Yes, Mentos in a Coke. Very good, very good example. So uh, it's interesting yeah, though when they when they do the the CO two extraction of of hops, they use uh, you know uh, liquid form CO two, yeah. don't they? Yeah, it's cryogenic. It's liquid form. It's really, really cold. Uh, Michael, is that like sub two sixty to get CO two liquid? What is that temperature? Uh, well, see, the problem with CO two is it doesn't really uh, end up in liquid form unless you pressurize it. It actually so will um, deposit as dry ice. Right. So you have to actually do it under pressure if you want PSI. liquid. Yeah. So that's a curve. High then. pressure, yeah, and then. You can get it to actually go from being super critical to, or you know, above the 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 is that condensation point, uh, triple point. All right. Then he asks. Also, I tend to make my yeast starters the night before I brew, thus I typically pitch them after about eighteen to twenty four hours. I leave the starter on the stir plate this entire time. Do you recommend this, or is it unnecessary? If I was to not pitch that starter until, let's say, 48 hours, would it be detrimental to the yeast to leave it on the stir plate that entire time? Thanks in advance for answering my questions, and thanks for all the years of service you've done to the home brewing community. Um, if you leave it on the starter for, so technically, uh, depending on the, the stir bar, it's a completely flat stir bar. You know, there's the ones with the rings in the middle, kind of keep it up off the bottom. But the stir bar, flat stir bar across the bottom of the could pop some yeast cells. That, that really? can, yeah. Um, generally, you know, the liquid, it floats on the liquid, but there could be some damage to the yeast cells. I don't really worry about it, but. Um, the reason I wouldn't go 48 hours after with a stir plate and um, most yeast, most volumes of starters that you're going to do, 
you know, within 18, 20 some odd hours, the growth of yeast is completely done. There's no more growth that's going to happen at that point. I would turn it off just from that and I would put it in the fridge and let it settle out. And then when when time to brew comes, I would decant the the spent uh, starter wort. So you're not adding that to your beer. And then I'd leave a little bit in there so I could swish it around and then I would pitch just the yeast. And I think that that is is probably the ideal way to do it versus um, just leaving it sitting there warm for 48 hours. So it's going to end up using up some of its energy reserves sitting there warm for 48 hours versus you chill it. It, it tends to right. build its glycogen reserves, et cetera. Also, also why, why pitch the spent word? The, the quote unquote beer that right. smells like uh, other beer that we don't buy and drink typically. Exactly. I, I was going to say, based on um, my readings in, in uh, this book called How to Brew, um, he, John talks a lot about either pitching at High Croyston, the starter, when it's really going. Or 12 to, 12, to, 12 to 16, 12 to 18 hours, somewhere in there, turning off the stir plate, because that way you're kind of cutting off the oxygen and then the yeast will go to sleep. Like they'll, they'll keep their trihalose and, and the, you know, yeah. nutrient reserves and go to sleep. And that way you're not pitching tired. He said, I remember in the, the hot brew, if you leave that starter, the stir plate running the whole time, Mm-hmm. And at least in how to brew, he talked about you, you'd be pitching the yeast tired. They won't have any reserve. I mean, that might be kind of based on just conversations on the show or something. But um, the 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 thing is, um, oxygen is no no issue to the yeast. Um, the yeast will use as much oxygen as they can get generally the 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 thing is growth is done generally before all the sugars are utilized you don't fully use utilize all the sugars in growth but um so there's a there's a point that the yeast manufacturers know where when uh, you've reached a certain point, they actually crash chill their yeast and it causes the yeast to uh, build their glycogen reserves. So it's good for storage, good for use later on. This is one of the reasons that Y Labs can make yeast and send it to you, you know, several weeks later and it's in peak, peak condition is because they've used that. If you let them go further until like the very end of things, um, you know, until you don't see any action going or, or whatever, and you think it's all completely done. Um, you're not going to get the same level of glycogen reserve in there. And this is why other packages so, that aren't necessarily smack packs might swell when warmed. Right. Because they've artificially halted the yeast to keep, uh, as Michael was talking about, or the glycogen right. reserves. Right. And Very interesting. The, the, um, so, uh, I'm trying to think about what, what you said there, Michael. Sorry. Um, but I, I, I mean, I almost designed my process straight out of how to brew where it was that 12 to 12 to 16 hour period of, of stirring, shut it down, let it settle goes in the fridge by 24 to 48 or 24 to 36 no longer than 48 and i've had pretty pretty awesome results i mean i could i mean that's yeah i'm kind of leaning on on how to brew so yeah that's generally what uh what uh the process is yeah um I would just I, I I would not um leave a starter on a stir plate for a long period of time. 48 hours is probably too much. Um 
you know, uh, generally I would start it one day, the next day I would pull it off. I would put it in the fridge, chill it, pour off the, the spent work, and then use the the yeast then. It, can I just one last experience thing? Uh -huh. So this fridge I keep at 31 for conditioning. I don't recommend putting a starter in that kind of fridge because I felt like I kind of stunned them by going below freezing. So yeah, well, so that was kind of, I felt like I ended up almost with a with a, a stuck fermentation because I I, I don't I, know if I can attribute it exclusively to that. But. Well, there's yeah, there's a couple of things, and I'm not sure how the yeast manufacturers are chilling their yeast uh, cultures down, but if you drop the temperature too rapidly, uh, you will cause the yeast to express uh, heat shock proteins. And the heat shock, but you get a heat shock from chilling as you right. do eating. So uh, too rapidly a chilling could cause them to, and, and generally it shouldn't be that much of a problem, but what happens is it utilizes its resources in creating these, these, these proteins that, it wouldn't normally if you if you didn't if you didn't do that. So um, I I always you know tried to chill it down a little slower than that. I wouldn't put it into like a freezing situation. Right. Essentially, you know, uh, I would I would put it into uh, you know just start chilling it down. Um, and then what I preferred to do was kind of grow my my yeast. Uh, like a week in advance. And then the day of brewing, I would take sterile wort and I would add that to the yeast and get them active and fully active and then pitch that at a uh, high croissant. You smack pack them. Essentially, yeah. Essentially. And, and you know, with, with the yeast of high croissant and you've, you've grown up a bunch of healthy yeast and you, you know, um, you, you haven't tired out the yeast by leaving them in too long. And then you add the, uh, you add the wort, the starter wort. Um, you, you, you get pretty much the best results that you're going to get. Uh, let's see here. Okay. For a break. Uh, let's see here. I think Travis is like pseudo the, the show producer he's always on top of the breaks he's on top of the questions he's on it <laughs> he's our new oh, it's, it's uh, or, yeah. or jamil's lackey whatever he calls it you know travo travo and yeah, we've got <laughs> the hours no need for travo not quite as good looking as bevo but he's in oh my god i'm sure you just hurt her feelings can Is i be watch porno, this shit can i be porno sorry <laughs> porno steve <laughs> You do kind of look like porno, Steve. Uh, let's see here. Uh, all right. Uh, Alexi uh, asks, uh, hello, a couple of questions for Jamel. One, he speaks about brewing constantly to get better. Is he speaking about brewing full five to 10 gallon batches or as long as your process is the same, can you do smaller brews, two to three gallons? I, I mean, it's, Yes and no. I, I think there's a lot of aspects of brewing that you could um, get familiar with and uh, perfect doing smaller batches. Sure. I, I don't think it's wasted, but part of you know repetitive brewing is getting to know your equipment and your measurements and all that stuff and to get repeatability. And repeatability is a great thing and brewing and because once you're able to repeat your process over and over and over the uh then that's your opportunity to start changing recipes you know once once you've mastered the actual physical aspect of brewing so um yeah you could do that absolutely uh but eventually you need to you know do be repetitive on the equipment and the scale that you're doing it uh and yeah. I, I, I would also just say, too, as somebody who started out doing one-gallon batches, um, your instruments 
to be able to measure ingredients and yeast pitches and pop additions at those smaller volumes become a little more tricky and the bigger you go or like you know even five gallon is kind of the the reason it's the norm is because that's where i think ingredients and and your process becomes more repeatable because that decimal point has been moved mm-hmm. and 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 you know making having a having a scale with an error of 0.1 grams at mm-hmm. five gallons is nothing who cares yeah. And versus if you're doing one gallon, that's that that mistake's been multiplied five times. Yeah, so. that's a good point. Well, uh, how was it for you scaling from your one gallon to your five gallon or your 10 gallon, whatever you're on now? I mean, because I, I think the question is, sure, you can learn. And obviously you, you have brewing on one gallon, but you're going to scale sooner or later. So every one of your recipes is going to change in some degree, not just by a multiple five. Yeah, I mean, for me. I was on a Pico brew, which I pretty much nailed down. The efficiency was, I mean, not good. And so my recipes kind of got flipped upside down once I got to my, I do 10 gallons at a time now. Um, But at least in terms of grasping the science and understanding the concepts and getting kind of an an introductory where you're not making huge investments. I mean, maybe if it's something you can kind of see if you want to do. But I would say if you're trying to take that step from making beer to making great beer, award-winning beer, the the volumes that are, are typically talked about at homebrew scale are, I think there's a reason for that. And there's a reason that the yeast packs are all sized for five gallons. And, and it's just, it becomes more controllable at the, the instruments that we typically use, I guess. And that, that's, a, my, again, these are all my experiences and my opinions and my readings. So. I feel like the word you were looking for was beer, you know, making beer to making beer. We put the test, we put the testicles in technical. <laughs> or is it technical and testicle? I don't know. One of those. That was always my favorite. That was always my favorite read right there. I thought uh, you liked uh, with, the, was it, uh, the, the, we're like the Lance Armstrong of brewing, except for that right. nut thing. Um, <laughs> All right. So second question is, is the online Siebel course uh, respected in the brewing field? I'm looking at getting some experience to perhaps move into the field. Do I need to just suck it up and go to either UC Davis or the on-site Siebel course? Uh, he has a bachelor of science in biology. Um, yeah, I, I don't think, I don't think it matters. I think personally, I think much higher of UC Davis than uh, Siebel, but Siebel's good too. Um, American uh, Brewing uh, School or Brewing American Brewing, what, what's it called? Uh, out on the Academy. East Coast. Yeah, um, I, I actually hired somebody from there. Uh, so I, I think it's more important that you show that you are that you've studied and you you've put the extra effort into learning about about brewing before you go in the field. That shows up on on the resume. It doesn't matter which one it is. That shows up. Um, I think personally, I think Davis is better, but you know, I may be I may be uh, partial to it. Um, but um, me too. But uh, any of them, any of them is good. Whatever you can afford, whatever whatever is you know works best for you. Uh, go ahead and do it, um, and it'll 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 help you. All right, let's take a quick break, and then uh, we will. Hit, hit the last question in the chat and then we're done all right we'll be back right after this all right we're back answering your questions live and uh jesus has a question it's a it's a very easy one it's a yes or no question um you guys have any experience with really sours or sour to say sarvicia acidification during fermentation so it's kind of like yes or no and I, i'm partial I've been I've had a Jason experience, but not direct experience. Jamil, yes or no? Yeah, it's it's uh so I haven't heard of Philly Sours. I mean uh so is, Philly, is every Sour. every location now doing their own version of sours? No, it's it's, it's, a, it's a different uh it's a different yeast. Philly sour, uh I heard of before the sour VCA. Uh-huh. Uh but they're they're both uh I think they're both sac that reduce lactic during fermentation. Uh-huh. 
What is it? How does that make it a Philly sour? It, they, if you buy the package from Lala, I think it's Lalamond, uh-huh. it's it's called Philly sour. Oh, really? Um, I didn't yeah. reach out to them and ask them why it's called Philly why? sour, but sour BCA yeah. and Philly sour, two different two different manufacturers, similar. Did somebody in Philly like throw their underwear in 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 the in the fermenter and and they it might have been a pretty horse and comes with uh, peppers and onions. What? Did peppers and onions go catch a Phillies game? There you go. It, it, it might have been a pretty <laughs> horse, you know, or a sour horse. You know, I don't know because that's also known as a Philly. You know, Philly. I don't. I don't know. Oh Philly. yeah. Yeah. Um, so the so right the the yeast that that do the the souring it's and they're actually pretty good. I've tasted a, a a number of beers that have been made with that method, and and they're and they're good. They're generally clean. I think. Um, uh, the the reason that some people will don't go that route is that they don't quite get the acidification that they want. Um, so some people want to go a little further. So I was just talking to a friend of mine who um, won gold medal at GABF with his his sour beer, and that was using the the kettle souring method that that. Uh, we had used a, a, a heretic, which is um, you get your your mash, you boil for 15 minutes, uh, and then you cool it down. And then once you're down to about, you know, 100, 104 degrees Fahrenheit, you add uh, plantarum. Uh, I did this at uh, Fuller's in England. Uh, we used plantarum uh, and did, did the same thing. It turn, turns out great. Um it's it's clean and uh you know it's it so so that that works out well and then you you heat it up again kill the bacteria and then you you transfer pitch your whatever yeast you want to ferment with and that works great and you have a much better control over the ph you can you can get it down a little bit lower whereas this friend of mine he was telling me that he tried those yeasts and he was getting uh he wasn't quite able to get as low as he wanted using the, those yeasts. So I think you have less control over it if you use these uh, souring yeasts versus using a bacteria that will take it down even lower. And you, then you just cut it off with, with heat when you're, right. when you're done. You can't do that in a fermenter. So that's, that's kind of the, the drawback on that, Jesus, is um, not having the control you want. I think that the, the flavor quality is there. Um, and you know, now more brewers are going to do it because it's just cheaper and easier. And that's why like barrel aged sours are, are dying because nobody wants to put in the, 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 the effort and the cost into doing it. Cause nobody will pay more for them these days. Cause, uh, the and average all, just doesn't know about it. We, in all fairness, a lot of those were not very good. Some of those were excellent. Some of them needed to go away. That's a good point. Well, a lot of the, a lot of the sour beers that people are making uh, can can be pretty horrible. Um, yes, you know, there's there's great but, ones, but there's also bad ones. But but Berliner slash sour BCA slash Philly sour, they're not exactly the same. But that's one style versus true sours. Mm. You know, where if you don't like Cantillon, you probably don't like the true sours. True. To your point, um, and and not everybody can pull that off. It's a whole lot easier to pull off, in my opinion, uh, a Berliner style or a Goat style, um, than it is a nine months aging in a barrel. Hope you get something out drinkable. Right. Right. And, yeah. But I, I've I've had some uh, that I know were brewed with sour BCA, and well, they're they're not straight Berliners, which even if Berliner is not a straight Berliner, you add some fruit and stuff after, you know, a little bit of the. Uh, mm-hmm. What do you call it? The, there's the green stuff and the red stuff. Uh, uh, the shoes. The, the, yes. The shoes. Yes. Yes. And they look at you very funny in Berlin if you say, I want one straight. Right. They look at you sideways. Uh, but but uh, I, I think if you're going for a fruited Berliner style sour, those products can make you a decent one for sure. But sure. you have to put in the work to make it go to where you want. And as you said, uh, it may not end up at the pH you want, whether that's too high or too low. Too right. high, throw some lactic in. You're already not following the process. Who cares? Too low, I don't know. Good luck. 
Yeah, I, I think you know if you're if you're home brewing and want to do it, I, I think it's a, a great way to go. Um, you know, if it doesn't turn out sour enough, you could always just spike it with a little bit of lactic acid. Yeah, I think you know that's fine. Commercially, yeah, I, I, I don't know. So I I guess just from for me, I <clears throat> I can't really speak to sours, so that's why I've been uniquely quiet right now i i really haven't <laughs> taken a stab at sour i mean well, yeah. i look at it i look at it as a, a whole nother realm like you guys are talking about the different ways to achieve sourness the control of ph the i mean even as a home brewer there's considerations about sanitation and being able to maintain like i know that five gallons can become sour only at least mm -hmm. that's what the rumor is and so I, I uh, would recommend trying the sour VCA. If, yeah. you if, if you're just starting in sours, brewing sours, I would try the sour VCA. I, I think that that's a good move. And then once you've done that, if you like, oh, I want more sour or less sour or something like that, then yeah. try doing the plantarum thing. I think it's a better way. And then God forbid, maybe you get into, you know, the various bacteria and wild yeasts and stuff and do it a barrel aged sour over a couple of years and that'd be fantastic. Yeah. So it, 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 I think, I think I'm right on this, Jamil. One is natural, one's created. And I think the Philly might be one they found and the sour um, BCA might be one they made. There you go. All right. And I have, I, I don't, I don't, Care either way, I, I think I've gotten past that hump for making good beer. Uh huh. Um, but for memory, and you know, sooner or later we'll have a thousand listeners that'll say that Travis guy, he's totally freaking off on that. Anyway, well, you and me both. I'm sure. All right. Yeah, all of us are going to be. What a bunch of. <laughs> <laughs> what a bunch of idiots! <laughs> you know, listenership's just going to go in the tank. It's just, <laughs> it's just so, you know, poor Justin, he's going to, he's going to have to like get an actual job. All right. <laughs> Thanks everybody for listening. We really appreciate you guys tuning in, especially live uh, and asking your questions. Thank you. Jesus. Thank you. Uh, uh, Edward. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Uh, Scott. Scott. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Travis. Thank you, Michael uh another Thanks, great show uh make sure if you appreciate this reach out to to john blickman at blickman engineering you can send him an email feedback at blickmanengineering.com it actually goes directly to john blickman uh then there's not some lackey checking these it's john blickman that reads them and he does appreciate it you can tell him uh, uh how much you appreciate it uh he's a great guy and uh, uh if you're at the conference in san diego this year uh you know Go, to, go up to him. Just say, hey, thank you. Uh, you know, he's, he's a, just a, a lovely person to, to talk with and, and hang out with. So hopefully we'll see you there. Until then, everybody, Bruce Strong. Bruce Strong. Bruce Strong. <laughs>